want you to hit me as hard as you can. In 1987, director Paul Verhoeven made his first major Hollywood movie with the visceral cyborg story Robocop, a masterpiece of bloodshed and satire that became a financial success. A decade later, Verhoeven again turned his eye to satirical sci-fi carnage with the big-budget war epic Starship Troopers, but was met with scathing reviews, audience bewilderment, and disappointing box office results. Then let's gear up and take a look at what the f*** happened to this movie. The year 1959 saw the publication of the novel Starship Troopers from influential science fiction author Robert A. Heinlein. A veteran of the US Navy and an ardent admirer of the military, Heinlein had built his literary career with stories in astounding science fiction magazine and young adult novels like Rocket Ship Galileo and Space Cadet. He had infused politics into stories like his alien invasion thriller, The Puppet Masters, and the award-winning Double Star, but Heinlein gave the impression of a stronger socio-political statement with Starship Troopers. Set hundreds of years from now, the book's vision of a perfect futuristic society involved a global militarized government that demanded service of its citizens and dealt with crime ruthlessly and publicly. The story detailed an interstellar war between humanity and an extraterrestrial race of intelligent insects, but also seemed like Heinlein's own personal diatribe against what he considered ineffectual liberal attitudes of the 1950s. Although the book was popular and won a Hugo Award, its fervently pro-military stance drew a fair share of controversy. It would be more than three decades before Heinlein's novel began its journey to the big screen. In late 1991, Robocop co-writer Ed Neumeyer met with that movie's producer John Davison and mentioned an idea for an outer space movie about killing giant insects. Davison sparked to the concept, feeling that it held commercial appeal, and also thought it could be another ideal showcase for Robocop's special effects artist Phil Tippett, whose work he admired. Both Davison and Neumeyer were familiar with Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers and noted its similarities to their idea, but they assumed the rights to that book were not available and decided to develop their concept as something original. Neumeyer eventually came back with a treatment for a sci-fi action story called Bug Hunt at Outpost 9, which was pitched to TriStar Pictures executive Chris Lee, who turned it down. The pair brainstormed ways to change Lee's mind and kept returning to Heinlein's book. After actually inquiring about optioning the rights, they discovered it was in fact available, and they went right back to Lee with a new pitch to make Starship Troopers instead. Lee and TriStar Head of Development Mike Metavoy, who had helped with getting Robocop made, jumped on board and the project slowly started moving forward. As Neumeyer worked on the script, he and Davison could think of only one director qualified for the job, the man who had dispatched metallic police officer Alex Murphy to violently clean up old Detroit. After Robocop, Dutch director Paul Verhoeven had a pair of Hollywood blockbusters with the Arnold Schwarzenegger smash Total Recall and the steamy psychological thriller Basic Instinct. But he had also experienced the collapse of other prestige projects in the early 90s, like the female pirate movie Mistress of the Seas with Gina Davis, and his passion project with Schwarzenegger, the historical action epic Crusade. In an effort to help convince Verhoeven of Starship Troopers' potential, Davison showed him the 1954 Atomic Ant movie Them, which gave the director some ideas. A fan of science fiction, Verhoeven cited a desire to make a space movie like Star Wars and also get another opportunity to work with special effects veteran Phil Tippett. He agreed to make Starship Troopers, but only after he finished his current film, Showgirls. Alas, we know all too well how that movie was received. By 1994, the project boasted Verhoeven's commitment and a solid draft of the script, along with some incredible alien designs and involvement from an Oscar-winning effects supervisor. But it still couldn't get a legitimate green light from the studio. Initial estimates pegged the budget at $90 million, which made the executives at TriStar and its home at Sony quite hesitant. For comparison, bringing the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park to life in 1993 cost $63 million while Independence Day had a budget of $75 million. Frustrated by the lack of progress, the team decided to make what would be known as the Bug Test, a proof-of-concept video showcasing a live person interacting with Tippett's CG aliens. Verhoeven took a day off from Showgirls to shoot a scene with a soldier, played by Olympic gymnast Mitch Gaylord, blasting an arachnid before he meets a messy demise. The effects took several months for Tippett's team to complete, but the demo impressed the studio enough for the project to take the next steps. 
The filmmakers were allowed to continue as though they were in standard pre-production, but TriStar and Sony still refused to officially pull the trigger. Nobody wanted a repeat of Waterworld. The soggy 1995 Kevin Costner vehicle that had notoriously inflated to a cost of $175 million and didn't gross even half of that at the domestic box office. We can ill afford another Clendathu. And so, Starship Troopers languished in a state of studio uncertainty for nearly a year after the bug test as Sony waffled over the budget and searched for a corporate partner to share the movie's exorbitant cost. With input from Verhoeven, who by his own admission never finished reading Heinlein's book, Neumeyer continued turning the screws on the movie's script. Excised from Heinlein's novel and the adaptation were numerous significant elements, including a second alien enemy race of green humanoids called Skinnies, and the personal drop capsules that delivered soldiers to the battlefield. Characters were removed, added, or combined, such as the fusion of Rico's teacher Jean Dubois and Roughneck's leader Lieutenant Ratchik, and the book's male Dizzy Flores was merged with the script's original love interest character, a girl named Ronnie. Also eliminated was The Bounce, special hardware that allowed soldiers to spring high into the air where they could survey the area and open fire on enemies from above. Verhoeven wasn't convinced that audiences want to see an army on pogo sticks, preferring instead to keep troopers literally grounded. Perhaps the most notable omission, at least with fans of the novel, was power armor. These mechanical exoskeletons could give soldiers enhanced strength and technological advantages, and in Heinlein's own description, made the wearer look like a big steel gorilla armed with gorilla-sized weapons. But as much as the filmmakers want to include power armor, they couldn't justify the cost or the conceptual inclusion, and instead put their focus on gritty battlefield combat to make the movie feel more like World War II in space. As for initial concerns over the book's militant overtones, they decided to lean into it for the movie playing up those aspects to the point of extreme satire with hopes that audiences will be able to read further than the explosive action and flashy special effects to see the filmmaker's subversive intent. Finally, in late 1995, as Verhoeven completed Showgirls, Disney agreed to partner with Sony to make Starship Troopers, splitting the cost in exchange for foreign distribution rights. Alan Marshall, who had produced Cliffhanger, Jacob's Ladder, and Basic Instinct, came on board to share producing responsibilities with John Davison. Phil Tippett and his studio colleagues continued to refine and visualize the antagonist, and prepared for the gargantuan task of creating a vicious insectoid army. Verhoeven didn't want the bugs wielding guns nor technology, so the designs incorporated biology as weaponry. This resulted in a whole catalog of lethal enemies that were never mentioned in Heinlein's novel, like the decapitating hopper bugs, acid-throwing tankers, and the enormous plasma bugs capable of launching destructive artillery into the upper atmosphere. Their idea was for the bug hierarchy to parallel humans, with detached leaders on top and mindless killers at the bottom. To shoot the movie, Verhoeven brought back his Robocop and Total Recall cinematographer, Yust Vacano, Hollywood stunt veteran Vic Armstrong, who had also worked on Total Recall, in addition to the Superman and Indiana Jones movies, that's him running from the boulder and sliding under the truck in Raiders, served as the movie's stunt coordinator and second unit director. With guidance from Verhoeven, it was up to production designer Alan Cameron and his art directors to develop the overall look of the film. Although set in the far future, they wanted everything to seem practical and familiar, like a distant extension of current technology. For the brutal Whiskey Outpost sequence, Verhoeven wants something like a foreign legion fort with a bit of influence from the 1964 siege classic Zulu. Instead of sleek and elegant spaceships, Verhoeven preferred the appearance of lumbering supertankers for the movie's bulky intergalactic transport craft like the Roger Young, named after the World War II Medal of Honor recipient. Ellen Mirajnik and Nick Scarano were responsible for the intimidating job of creating the wardrobe for the ambitious production. Around 2300 costumes were eventually crafted for the movie. With power armor dropped from the script, Verhoeven and Mirajnik worked to make the soldiers' outfits more utilitarian. The final mobile infantry body armor was visually distinctive, but the downside was that the actors were covered in over 40 pounds of gear. To retain the desired sense of realism, the standard mobile infantry rifles needed to appear functional. Special effects department head John Richardson had already done something similar for James Cameron's aliens by using real firearms dressed up as futuristic weapons. Along with hundreds of rubber rifles, around 120 functioning guns were built for Starship Troopers. After filming wrapped, weapons coordinator Rocco Lodi estimated that over 300,000 rounds of blank ammunition were expended during the shoot. 
As the production crew was assembled, storyboards were created, in addition to approximately 4,000 drawings that Verhoeven himself had done, while he awaited studio approval and a financed art department, sometimes sketching directly on the script. And the search began for the movie's primary cast of Buenos Aires high school students turned soldiers. Like many things about the production, this proved to be a challenge. Casting started looking for age-appropriate movie stars to play the leading teens, but found that those kinds of actors were unavailable, or non-existent. The shortage of younger film talent prompted them to consider television actors instead, even though at the time, there was a clear class distinction between the two formats. Verhoeven's people found a surplus of virtually unknown but capable 20-somethings working in TV, and decided to make their own movie stars. For the leading role of Johnny Rico, Mark Wahlberg and James Marsden were considered before the selection of chiseled Beverly Hills 90210 actor Casper Van Dien, who shared some parallels with the character, having played high school football and attending military school. Former model Denise Richards was chosen for Carmen Ebenez, the ambitious pilot and love of Rico's life. Dina Meyer, another 90210 alum, scored the role of Tom Girl Dizzy Flores, who relentlessly craves Johnny's affections. Melrose Place actor Patrick Muldoon was cast as Rico's romantic rival Xander Barklow, and Neil Patrick Harris, best known at the time for starring in four seasons of Doogie Howser MD, got the role of psychic high school friend Carl Jenkins. Although the primary cast averaged a decade older than actual high school students and looked more like they lived in Southern California than South America, prompting Melrose space jokes during production, this surface perfection was intentional in Verhoeven's part to reflect the movie's deeply structured society. So we tried to find people that were resembling a proto-fascist ideal. Character actors Michael Ironside and Clancy Brown were given the secondary but crucial roles of teacher-slash-soldier Lieutenant Ratchik and stern drill instructor Sergeant Zim. Jake Busey and Seth Gilliam landed the parts of Rico's soldier comrades Ace Levy and Sugar Watkins. The movie would also have appearances by future Breaking Bad actor Dean Norris, who was also in Verhoeven's Total Recall. Rue McClanahan of The Golden Girls as a blind instructor of alien biology, and even a cameo by producer John Davison, who ended up with one of the movie's most memorable lines. The only good bug is a dead bug. To assist the actors in effectively portraying soldiers, they attended a boot camp led by retired Marine Captain Dale Dye, who had performed similar duties on Oliver Stone's platoon before becoming a regular consultant on Hollywood military movies. Van Dien, Richards, Busey, Meyer, and Gilliam, along with a number of extras, endured 11 days of rigorous physical training and combat tactics to help convincingly play the bug-killing soldiers. Dye continued providing military instructions on the set, while the trained extras were given squads of their own to command. That preparation would come in handy right from the start. Because of the groundbreaking complexity involved in bringing the armies of alien bugs to life, it was necessary to shoot all those intense action sequences early in the process so Tippett and his team would have sufficient time to complete the effects in post-production. During filming, Verhoeven used his exuberant pantomime to appropriately terrify actors without real giant bugs present. An area of Wyoming, ominously called Hell's Half Acre, was the setting for Alien Worlds Clendathu and Planet P, where most of the ground action took place. On the initial grueling shoot over six weeks, the crew discovered that the location for Whiskey Outpost was infested with rattlesnakes, and the entire area was continually battered with rain, snowstorms, and 80 miles per hour winds. Even without the presence of monstrous arachnids, it seemed as though the train itself was trying to murder everyone. Beyond the alien activity, many of the remaining scenes like the classrooms, training camp, and jump ball arena were filmed on Sony's Culver City lot. The bridge of the Roger Young was a 20 by 40 foot soundstage set, complete with various command stations along with functioning lights and monitors. To achieve proper lighting within the bridge during the disastrous deployment over Planet P, they moved different colored lamps across a green screen to create what Verhoeven called an orchestra of lights for the special effects team to match later. Coming from a progressive country, Verhoeven was interested in showing the futuristic society's vision of citizens' equality with the movie's co-ed sports and military. This extended to the barracks and showers, for which he famously disrobed to make his actors feel more comfortable with their own nudity in the scene. Verhoeven also wanted to play with gender reversals, like Johnny joining the military because he's in love with Carmen, only for her to end up dumping him to focus on her career. Would you like to know more? Nearly six months after filming started, principal photography and second unit shooting finished in October of 1996, surviving harsh weather, various illnesses, a bomb scare, and a car accident that claimed the lives of two crew members. 
and the complicated and lengthy post-production process continued. Unsurprisingly, for an outer space war movie of such magnitude, Starship Troopers required an absurd amount of different special effects, or perhaps the most substantial contribution coming from Tippett's studio, a master of stop-motion animation. Tippett had earned his reputation for movies like The Empire Strikes Back, Dragon Slayer, and Robocop, but it was his Oscar-winning work on Jurassic Park that proved crucial to Starship Troopers, specifically the digital input device that was developed for the dinosaurs, allowing animators to translate physical movements to a digital wireframe model. That was instrumental for creating the bugs, along with dozens of staff members, hundreds of workstations, and countless computer cycles for rendering. Given the level of realism Tippett achieved on Jurassic Park, it makes sense that the CG of Starship Troopers also holds up well, more than two decades later. As producer John Davison put it, thank God Phil decided to do Starship. Without him, we wouldn't have had a movie. There are plenty of others involved in the special effects. Amalgamated Dynamics Inc., who had worked on Tremors and the original Jumanji, built the movie's full-scale creatures and puppets. This include working warrior bugs and their demolished carcasses, the Arkelian sand beetles like the one dissected by Johnny and Carmen, a practical section of the massive tanker bug that gets obliterated by Rico, and an operable model of the grotesque brain bug. Kevin Yager's company, which had previously done the Freddy Krueger makeup for several Nightmare on Elm Street movies, handled the prosthetic makeup for Starship Troopers. This involved everything from Ratchek's stump and cybernetic arm, to the numerous gruesome trooper corpses littering the combat scenes, to the puppet of Xander getting his skull sucked by the brain bug. It was decided early on in development that Tibbet would be responsible for all the effects for the bugs, but studio politics dictated that their own in-house company, Sony Pictures Image Works, would also be heavily involved as part of the package which the filmmakers came to regret. SPI was meant to provide all the spaceship shots, but due to miscommunication, mismanagement, and an apparent workload from other movies, they were months behind schedule. In order to make the planned release date of July 2nd, 1997, one year after alien invasion thriller Independence Day blew up the box office on that holiday weekend, many critical effects shots needed to be reassigned to other houses like Boss Film and Industrial Light and Magic. The SPI situation was eventually sorted late in production thanks to the addition of supervisor Scott Anderson, and the company did produce a number of remarkable sequences, including the destruction of the Roger Young, which was an 18-foot model designed to split in half. They also completed one of the most complex shots of the movie. During the dropship launch over Planet P, which used more than 200 separate elements of CG and scale models combined. Edder Mark Goldblatt, who had worked on James Cameron's Terminator movies and True Lies, pieced the film together and managed to secure an R rating. And the rousing score was provided by Basil Polderis, who would also compose Robocop as well as The Hunt for Red October and Conan the Barbarian. Finally, Verhoeven had completed his subversive but seemingly straightforward sci-fi saga about attractive futuristic teens who enlist in the military, as required for citizenship, have their home city annihilated by alien insects from across the galaxy, and travel into the arachnid quarantine zone to crush this inhuman threat. Making the movie had been a monumental effort. As Verhoeven states in the Making of Starship Troopers book, putting together Starship Troopers was like constructing Notre Dame Cathedral. Thousands of people worked on it, but no one person can take credit for the final building. He says the movie effectively had three directors, himself, Phil Tibbet, and Vic Armstrong, who was responsible for a whopping 900 second unit shots. Tippett credits the technical advancements and collaboration of his studio and thought of himself more as a choreographer, the Bob Fosse of Bugs. Still, the studio had obviously become sufficiently concerned while the finishing touches were applied. The prime release date of July 2nd was instead given to Men in Black, which became a huge box office success. Starship Troopers was pushed to July 25th, which then got switched to Sony's Harrison Ford vehicle Air Force One, another financial success. Starship Troopers finally landed in theaters on November 7th, 1997. Thanks to the promise of outer space excitement and a lack of major competition, it opened in first place with $22 million. But with poor word of mouth, it sank by 55% in its second weekend, an uncommonly large drop for a big budget release at the time. It finished with $54 million domestic and $121 million worldwide on a budget that reportedly rose to $105 million. Reviews were not kind, using terms like lobotomized, senseless, lurid, no-brainer entertainment, and devoid of taste and logic. Some critics even included on their worst of the year lists. Many noted the graphic violence and unnaturally good-looking cast, but also took the movie at face value without seeing it as a statement on xenophobia and militarism. 
Some viewers assumed the movie's Jangonistic tone and Nazi imagery were advocating for fascism, rather than making a sly statement against it. Without looking beyond the gloss and gory spectacle, that interpretation seems reasonable. After all, the very first scene is a military recruitment ad modeled after the Nazi propaganda film Triumph of the Will. And shortly after, Rico's teacher discusses the failure of democracy and promotes the idea that violence is the supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Even the ending was unorthodox. Rather than a traditionally satisfying blow up the Death Star moment of victory, the climax involved capturing a horrific alien slug it's a fray! and the promise that the ostensible good guys would just continue fighting in perpetuity as their society required. Verhoeven, a vocal and fiercely intelligent liberal who grew up in Nazi-occupied Holland during World War II and served in the military, has often gone on record to reinforce the movie's underlying satirical intentions. In a recent Digital Spy interview, he said Ed Neumeier and I disagreed with Robert Heinlein and we felt that we needed to counter with our own narrative. Basically, the political undercurrent of the film is that these heroes and heroines are living in a fascist utopia, but they are not even aware of it. They think this is normal, and somehow you are seduced to follow them, and at the same time, made aware that they might be fascists. How could a big-budget Hollywood movie presenting its main characters and their culture as pseudo-fascist, complete with state media indoctrination newsreels and Gestapo uniforms, actually make it to screens? According to Verhoeven, all the irony and hyperbole existed in the original script, but was largely overlooked thanks to a revolving door of studio executives. As he told the AV Club back in 2007, by the time one of them might have understood what movie I was going to make, he was already gone. The next group came in, I think we slipped through this labyrinth of changing regimes until finally the movie was done. But Hollywood had also become less appealing to Verhoeven. He only made one more big studio release after Starship Troopers, the disappointing Invisible Bacon horror movie Hollow Man in 2000. After that, he returned to the Netherlands for the war thriller Black Book and the drama L, which received an Oscar nomination for star Isabelle Huppert. Starship Troopers did prove popular enough on home video to justify a pair of low-budget live-action sequels made for video, plus a computer animated TV series and two CG movies, along with comic books, video games, and even a pinball machine. Fans of Heinlein's novel also finally got to see a kick-ass rendition of Power Armor. It just happened to be in Tom Cruise's Edge of Tomorrow. Starship Troopers has definitely benefited from hindsight, with more recent viewers recognizing its prescience and relevance as a criticism of government control, colonialism, and war in general. But it also works as an outstanding action movie. Take off!